um, with the Department of Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Caroline did her PhD in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Michigan, and that's where she really began her interest in the human bony pelvis, which we'll talk a little bit about today. Um, but she's been very interested in looking at the evolution of childbirth and uh, things in pelvic anatomy, particularly in Neanderthal females, um, and the different methods that we've used to estimate both biological sex and uh, pelvic anatomy in Neanderthals, and including how they differ from modern humans and the consequences of that. Uh, more recently, she's been working on a large uh, collaborative team that has analyzed a new fossil uh, hominid named Homo Deledi, which we're going to talk about with us today, that was discovered in the rising star King system in South Africa. And these were, of course, a uh, very well-known fossil that was announced last September, the first uh, analysis that Caroline also was published with on eLife. The fossil looks itself is, of course, uh, exciting and controversial for lots of reasons, in part for the kind of crazy, cave, complicated system and context that they were found in and deposited in, and she'll talk about that with us today, um, but also because of the mixed morphology of the fossil. Um, as far as some of the interests that everyone has. So I won't uh, keep you, I'll let you all have her. Um, and so her talk today is, of course, called Reproducing Home and Movie. So thank you for coming. Thanks. Exactly. There we are. Well, thanks for coming out in the rain. I appreciate it. Uh, as Sabrina said in her introduction, I'm Caroline Vansicle. And um, this is actually me um, at the announcement in at uh, the Maripang Museum in uh, outside of Johannesburg in South Africa on the day when the eLife article came out uh, announcing Homo Naledi. But uh, as she mentioned in her introduction for me, um, I am a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, I, even though I am a paleoanthropologist, I'm technically right now um, affiliated with the Gender and Women's Studies Department at the University of Wisconsin. And I do feminist biology, which means that I'm looking at how to uh, take a feminist perspective on doing paleoanthropology. How do we look at uh, what do we mean when we talk about sex? What are we basing sex on um, in the fossil record? What kind of gender roles are we play placing on the past? those sorts of things. And while that is not the focus of my talk today, and not actually something I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk, it is something I'm happy to talk with people about afterwards if that's something that they're interested in. So I'm here giving this talk on Homo Naledi because I was one of the 60-odd like, researchers who are part of the team who uh, came up with the fact that, this is, that these fossils from the Rising Star Cave System are a new species. And in particular, um, because of my work on uh, sexual dimorphism in uh, humans and fossil ancestors, uh, which led me to look at pelvic anatomy in fossils and particularly very fragmentary pelvic anatomy of, very, um, of uh, female Neanderthals from my dissertation, uh, I was brought in to be the lead researcher on the pelvis team for Homo naledi, and we are in the process of re uh, revising our submission or our manuscript for that. So uh, soon, hopefully, there will be a, a paper specifically on the pelvis of uh, Homo naledi, but that was my part of um, the research. So September 10th, 2015, so just last September, uh, this paper went live online. Uh, this is the eLife journal um, that uh, we published in, announcing that we found a new species, Homo naledi. Uh, it's open access, so anyone who has an internet connection can download this paper, look at our figures, look at our table, uh, all of that sort of thing. And it turns out a lot of people have done this. Um, I assume most of those are uh, academics and researchers, but um, I'm hopeful that some of them are actually not academics and that some of the uh, public interest in this uh, topic of human evolution is coming out as well. So as of this morning when I took the screenshot, uh, the uh, paper has been viewed online uh, 279,000 times, which is pretty cool. The day it came out, it was also all over the internet in terms of news stories. And as someone who grew up in Kansas where I didn't get to learn about human evolution in my high school biology class, it's really heartening to me to know that there is still public interest in human evolution. Um, and so this is really cool that there are, uh, that there's so much interest in what we uh, found. And this is true not just for our story, but for lots of stories um, when we find new species of uh, hominids. Now, of course, not all of the uh, responses on, uh, back in September were positive. Uh, 
here at Berkeley. We had some dissenters, which is really cool, actually. I want to make it clear that this is not a sign that we are antagon or antagonists. It's a sign that we're scientists. Uh, I would expect other scientists to be skeptical of our work. Um, I know that as we were going through the project, we were skeptical of our work. We kept double checking and asking each other, wait, are you sure that's what you're seeing? Show this to me again. What is your evidence for this? Because that's part of the scientific method. And it's great because I'm looking forward to how other scientists uh, interact with this data um, and the fossils and what comes out of this in the peer-reviewed literature uh, for the conversation as it moves forward. So, Homonawadi. These are the fossils. Well, this is uh, about 300 of the best fossils. Uh, but we found over 1,500 fossils in this cave system. They represent at least 15 individuals. And those individuals range from infants, literally infants, uh, to individuals who are so old that their uh, molars have worn down, suggesting that they were pretty old age. Um, exactly what that is in years, not as clear. Um, we see an unexpected combination of traits. And this is the main reason why we think this is a new species. And that's what I'm going to talk about today is that this, this combination of traits, it's unlike anything that we have seen before. And so we got together and we named this Homo naledi. This is the John Gerci reconstruction of what, we th what he thinks uh, Homo naledi might have looked like. So today I'm going to go through the story of how these fossils were found and how they were analyzed and studied by the scientists and what we uh, ended up and how we came to our conclusions. The story starts with Lee Berger. He's a paleoanthropologist who works at the University of the Witwatersrand in South Africa. Uh, and he is known previously for uh, being the father of the guy who uh, discovered the uh, Australopithecus sediba fossils um, and organizing that whole trip. But uh, he works, so he's in Johannesburg. And around Johannesburg, there's this area called the Cradle of Humankind where there's a whole bunch of fossil sites. Uh, this map only shows Rising Star Cave and Malapa, but there's also Sturkfontein and Swartkrans and things like that. Um, and so there's a lot of hominin history in this area that's just like a two-hour drive from his house, basically, um, depending on traffic. Johannesburg traffic's kind of crazy sometimes. And what Lee did was, after finding Malapa and going through the Australopithecus sediba find, he thought, you know, there's probably more fossils out there we need to get a way of actually looking for these kind of systematically. So he recruited some local spelunkers, uh, people who go caving for fun on the weekends. And this was in September of 2013, and said, hey, it would be really cool if we got a team together of people who are going into these caves anyway, who were willing to uh, look around and record whether or not they see anything that looks like a hominin. If they see a hominin, they should come talk to me. Um, and if they don't, then we know which caves have been, cave systems have been looked at already. And he thought, you know, maybe in the next five years, we might find one site, maybe. A month later, in October of 2013, these two gentlemen right here, uh, this is Steve Tucker in red and uh, Rick Hunter in black, um, were going through a cave system called Rising Star. And they were going in because uh, Rick wanted to show um, Steve, this very few beautiful uh, area right here in the cave. Um, and they thought, hey, you know, we'll kind of explore around and be part of Lee's team for this and uh, mark this cave off as one that probably doesn't have hominins in it. Well, getting into the cave, uh, you start up here. I'll do this. Uh, and you go down this area here, um, down this tunnel. This part's all pretty relatively easy, I'm told, for spelunkers. And you get to this little tight squeeze here called Superman's Crawl. And it's less than 10 inches high, as this says. And it's called Superman's Crawl because literally to fit through it, you have to kind of outstretch your arms like this and pull yourself through um, while your feet are kind of pushing through. Now, if you're shorter, I'm told uh, it's actually possible to get enough elbow room where you can kind of army crawl through it there. Uh, my colleague, Aliyah Gertov, does, prefers that method. But for most people, it requires kind of a Superman pose. So that's why it gets called Superman's Crawl. And then you're in this chamber here, which is a big, pretty one that they wanted to show off. Um, and it has this feature called Dragon's Back, which literally from the pictures looks like something out of The Hobbit in the sense that it is an uneven ridge that is very narrow, sheer drop on either side. Um, at the top, it's about uh, 15 feet tall, I believe. Uh, and so it's, it's not an easy climb, but it's a challenging climb, and the Splunkers really got into that. So the story goes that Steve climbed up to the top of it, 
And Rick was following him. And the top is very narrow, and so Steve needed to get out of the way so that Rick could get to the top. And so he found a cubby space that he kind of like wedged himself into. And so he got to the top of it, and he realizes this cubby space actually keeps going. In fact, there's a small hole here that drops down. And so seeing a small crevice that is completely dark and he hasn't been into and he doesn't know if anybody else has been into, uh, he does the completely logical thing that I'm sure we would all do in the same situation and sees if he can fit. So he wedges himself uh, down here, uh, gets to the drop part on the other, other side there, doesn't know how deep it goes, doesn't know if it's going to get too narrow for him to fit or anything like this. Um, but at this point has rock against his back, rock against his front, and just kind of like goes down like this um, until he gets to this part, which is about uh, 12 feet, I think, still above the uh, ground level, where he actually had to find like footholds and things to uh, climb down the rest of the rock surface. And he tells his friend, hey, you should come down here. This is a really fun climb. OK. So they get into this chamber, and they turn around, and they have their headlamps, and they actually have GoPro cameras with them. And they look around, and they see a mandible. They see a jawbone. And they're like, that looks vaguely human. And they're not paleoanthropologists. They couldn't tell you what species it is or anything like that. But they think, this is something we should tell that guy Lee Berger about. This is what he was talking about. So they uh, take some video of the cave floor. There's bones all over it. Um, they climb back out. This climb takes about 20 minutes. Um, the first time when they were doing this, it might have taken a tad longer. And they go and knock on Lee's door. They go to his house that night, and it's nighttime. And they're like, we know we're waking you up or it's right before bed, but you want to let us in. And they show Lee these videos. And so a few hours later, he's on the phone with National Geographic, who he already has some partnerships with, and says, I have something. You're going to want to fund this. And at the time, he thought, maybe there's a partial skeleton down there of one individual. But that's worth organizing all of my resources and getting this excavation to happen. So Lee, being a bit of an odd individual who goes about things in a different manner, um, puts up this Facebook ad. And the, the joke that I heard from uh, the vice president of uh, South Africa when he was um, announcing the uh, new species back in September was that the story goes, we put up this Facebook ad. He's requesting uh, a person who is skinny, preferably small, not claustrophobic. They, uh, they must fit. They must uh, have some caving experience. They have to have climbing experience as, if, they, if possible, uh, and willing to work in cramped quarters and have a good attitude and be a team player. He puts this ad up. He asks people to email, not him, but actually his administrative assistant, uh, Wilma who he does not tell about this at all. And Wilma comes into the office on Monday morning and has 20 emails or so from uh, people, mostly women, saying, I'm five foot two, and I weigh this much, and I think of this caving experience. And she's like, what on earth is this? Um, but they ended up with 57 applicants. Uh, Lee uh, Skyped with the top applicants from that and put together a team of six women who were going to be the excavators. Now, the cavers who went into, who, uh, Rick and Steve, who, were in, who found the chamber, they had the caving experience, but they didn't know how to do a hominin excavation. Um, there's a lot that goes into that where you have to make sure that you're doing it systematically, carefully, uh, so you don't break the fossils themselves. And so this team is made up of women who have that experience, who are experienced in the ability to uh, actually do the excavation. Um, and just as a shout out to my friend Aaliyah here, who's also at the University of Wisconsin, she actually snuck on to the team without any experience caving prior to this uh, and learned it all as she went along. But she's really good at excavating, so that worked out well. So by November of 2013, this moved very quickly, um, they were at the site in uh, South Africa. This is the entrance to the cave. Um, you walk down this little hill, there's like a sheer drop here of like 20 feet, so you've got to be careful there, um, and into this area. When you enter the cave, it looks like this. It's very pretty. Um, my friend Marina here is one of the excavators, and she told me that this shot took about 30 minutes to take, and the whole time uh, the National Geographic people who were taking the shot kept throwing dirt in the air toward her so that they could get the pretty shafts of sunlight. Uh, so when you have a professional photography team, you get photos like this from inside the cave. When you're taking selfies on your phone, you get blurry photos like this in the cave, because I've been in this part here. Um, I did not go beyond this point. Uh, but this little opening right here is that tunnel I showed you that they then crawl down and uh, spend the next 20 minutes squeezing through various tight holes and climbing up uh, Dragon's Back Ridge in order to get 
to the chamber itself, which is not very big. They worked in teams of two, um, and they actually very quickly realized that the ground was so soft that uh, they were in danger of possibly stepping on and breaking some of the fossils. Um, and so they went to a barefoot uh, excavation where they basically, the idea was that hopefully they would feel a bone before they put all of their weight down so they would be able to avoid breaking on anything. So they started out, they collected all of the bones from the surface. Uh, that was about 300 bones total. Um, and then they focused in on an area where they saw part of a cranium. And they're like, OK, we're going to excavate this part first because that looks like a cranium, and that could be really useful. So they did the excavation. Uh, and the area that they focus on is called the puzzle box. It's about one yard square by like eight inches deep. So it's not very much uh, space. Um, and the bones are just kind of stacked like uh, pickup sticks, where as soon as you try and move one, you're realizing you're disturbing another. And so it was a very slow, tedious uh, excavation for that. And the ground is soft. It's like dirt. So they're using brushes. They're using pl uh, plastic spoons in the case here, um, toothpicks, things like that to just very carefully get everything apart. And you'll notice that this video is uh, on a computer screen. That's because this is what the people who didn't fit into the cave were able to watch uh, while they were doing this, because with the help of those same spelunkers um, who had volunteered to look for hominin fossils, they were able to wire up the cave so that there are uh, lights, there is a communication system where they had a phone down in the uh, chamber itself where they could talk to people uh, up top if there was a problem or if they had a question about something. Um, and there was video so that they could actually kind of refer to things of like, OK, we're going to go after this bone next. What do you think? What uh, technique do you think we should use? And get advice as needed. Of course, the people on the surface, this is what they're doing. Um, they're in the tent staring avidly at these uh, videos, much like the one you just watched, uh, to see what is going on um, and be very excited as they are bringing these bones out. They bring the bones out wrapped in uh, bubble wrap, placed in a plastic container, Place, wrapped in bubble wrap again, multiple containers placed in a lunchbox, and then that lunchbox hooked onto someone while they climbed back out through. And they had uh, volunteer cavers throughout the cave, uh, partially there as a safety precaution, so people who were more experienced with the caving side of things than some of the excavators were in case something went wrong, but also to uh, help kind of carry these things carefully um, throughout the cave so that it wasn't just one person who was responsible for these very, very fragile things. And they were lucky. None of them actually seemed to break in the, that uh, process of transition. Some of them were broken when they found them. But uh, once they got up to the top of or out of the cave, they went to the science tent. Uh, here's Peter Schmidt uh, trying to figure out what something is. I can't actually see what he has in his hand there. But everything was photographed, labeled, um, given an accession number. They cleaned it up. They, uh, because the bone itself was um, kind of soft, it, uh, it ends up having a texture almost like dried wood. It's like uh, so not particularly stone-like you would expect a fossil to be. Um, and so some of it is very fragile, and so some of the pieces did have to be co uh, coated with uh, different sort of, uh, substances to keep them from breaking apart. But they keep track of all of this, and then the bones go into a safe that exists in another tent at the site, uh, because South Africa has very strict rules that hominin fossils have to be under lock and key even when they're in a tent. Um, and so I, this whole time, I was not involved with the project. I was actually adjunct teaching in Georgia um, and following all of this on Twitter, because they were tweeting about this as it was happening. And I was thinking, this is so cool. I don't know any of these people yet, but they are uh, excavating, and they're tweeting about what they're finding. And I remember the day that Lee tweeted, we have to send back to Vitz for more uh, for more safes, because they'd filled up the ones that they brought with them, because they kept finding more specimens. This was way more than one skeleton like he had initially predicted. So that was all really cool. But after they got done with this, and it was a three-week uh, excavation, they sent the fossils to the vault at the University of Witwatersrand, uh, the newly renovated and built vault, I should mention. Uh, and I like this picture because it shows you the big, thick bank vault door that is on this room. Um, and then beyond this room, there is um, just shelves lining the walls uh, that were mostly empty. And so Lee was thinking, you know, well, we have like the two shelves that take up the Malapa find. We have some shelves for uh, the stuff that we had found at Cirque Fontaine and some other sites before this. It's, you know, this vault will last us forever. It's going to take us forever to fill this up. Well, now the vault is pretty much full because they filled it up with Rising Star. 
After another Facebook ad, uh, Lee put together a team of early career researchers, including myself, uh, to come to the vault, spend five weeks in uh, Johannesburg, studying these fossils basically all day long, every day while we were there. Uh, so I'm right here not looking at the camera. Um, but this was most of the group. We actually didn't think to take a group photo until uh, the very, very end of the trek. And at that point, some people had already started to leave. But this is a large group. Uh, this is a large representation of the people who um, were working on this project while we were there. And so we did. We spent five weeks in the, actually five and a half weeks, I should say, um, working at tables like this. This is actually my workstation right here. You can tell because there's a pelvis. Um, with the bones out, we had casts from uh, all sorts of different hominin sites, some of which were already uh, there in the vault, some of which we brought with us from our various institutions so that we had a good represent a representation of uh, casts from other hominin material um, to compare to. And we split up into groups based on skeletal area. Uh, so I was the pelvis team right here, and um, across from me were the guys working on the uh, spine and rib cage. Uh, behind me, or so behind where this group is sitting, uh, there was the team working on the foot, and then the team working on the cranium, um, uh, the team working on the arm, the lower limb, all of this kind of stuff. And so we had so many bones from each area that it was important to get a large group together to do this, because it would have taken decades for one or two people to go through all of these materials um, in the way that is necessary for us to do a scientific analysis. But by splitting it up like this, we were able to do it a little more quickly. Now, don't get me wrong, we still spent all of our time doing this. We all stayed at the same hotel. We would shuttle to the campus together in the morning, spend all day in the lab looking at these bones, talking to each other over lunch about them, coming back to the lab, looking at the bones again, uh, taking measurements, making scans, uh, discussing different analyses that we could do. Then we'd shuttle back to the hotel. There was like one or two restaurants around the, that area that we would all go and eat at in different groups. Um, so we'd spend all of our time together, and so of course dinner conversation was nothing but, well, what, what do you think it is? Well, I think it's this. Well, how do you think they got in the cave? Well, maybe it's this. And so that was like all we did. And then we were actually sharing rooms with, the, um, it was two people to a room, and so even as you got ready for bed, you were still talking to your roommate about this um, and thinking about it as you fell asleep, only to wake up the next morning, have breakfast with everyone, and shut off to campus again and do it all over again. So we spent five and a half weeks really spending all of our time thinking about what on earth are these uh, rising star fossils, and how, how can we figure it out? So I'm going to go through the anatomy, uh, the comparisons that we made, and what we ended up uh, figuring out. Well, when we look at the brain size for Homo naledi, it's about 560 cent uh, cubic centimeters, and that's the large uh, estimate. There's other individuals that are a little smaller and are in the 400 range. Uh, to give you a comparison, humans, we average around 14, uh, 1,400 cubic centimeters. So this is a really small-brained creature. This is not a human, not even close. We also have multiple um, crania that we can look at cranial shape. And the cranial shape for uh, Homo naledi, shown by the best four here, um, is not one that is, uh, that is long front to back and short top to bottom. It's more globular, more circular than that. Uh, and so it's different than uh, what we see in some early Homo uh, species. We have tons of teeth. Some of them are beautiful and in mandibles like this. Uh, some of them, most of them are not in mandibles and they're just isolated teeth. But we've been able to actually go through and figure out which teeth go together uh, to come up with individuals. I'm very glad I was not on the tooth team that had to solve that puzzle because that sounded tedious to no end. Uh, I'm really a postcranial person. But the teeth for Homo naledi um, are very well represented. They all look very similar. Uh, so there's not a lot of variation between different individuals of the species. And when we compare them, so this is a Demonici 211, um, so a Homo erectus specimen. Uh, something to note is that the cusp pattern on the molars is a lot simpler in Homo naledi. These aren't the teeth of Homo erectus. If we move down the body to the shoulder, um, here's some uh, examples of we have multiple uh, humeri. Uh, I could actually only find one picture of the scapula, but I know we have more of the scapula than that. Um, but I like having the skeleton here, which is a artist reconstruction done by National Geographic, so it is by no means 100% accurate. Um, but I like how they do the shoulders here, because it kind of gets at what the shoulders of Homo naledi look like. They were hunched like this. 
um, which basically means that they had shoulders that looked more chimpanzee-like. Uh, they were more primitive. They were able to be more flexible um, in terms of being able to move their arm backwards like this. They're not going to get stuck uh, by their acromial process. Um, and so it's something that is going to make it so that uh, by having a more flexible shoulder, it's a potential adaptation for climbing that at least still exists in this species. Now, that doesn't guarantee that they were climbing, although they did apparently climb into the cave. Um, but they had that ability, which really puts them looking more like an Australopithecus than something in the genus Homo. When we looked at the hands, they look very human-like at first glance. The areas of the hands that aren't human-like, um, the ph phalanges of the fingers are curved slightly. Uh, so again, this is something that we see um, in like a chimpanzee or uh, a very primitive feature um, in Australopithecus, uh, suggesting that they would be better adapted to be able to hold onto things like tree branches or my own pet theory, uh, rock ledges in caves, because I, I keep pushing for a, they were adapted to living in caves, which nobody else thinks, don't, don't quote me on that. Um, <laughs> But the hands are this mixture of uh, both primitive and derived features. And the thumb has this weird thing going on. So this is the first metatarsal, so um, the metatarsal, sorry, metacarpal, can't speak today, metacarpal um, in the thumb, uh, going to the thumb. And this picture looks like it's upside down. It's not. Uh, it is actually thicker at the um, part where the thumb uh, actually branches off and starts than it is at the base where uh, the wrist is. And that's something unusual. We don't see that ever in anything. This is a pretty unique feature. Um, and so it's got this weird, weird trait that if we had only found one first metacarpal, we would think, OK, well, this individual was weird and maybe had pathology going on. But we have a whole bunch of these. We have this for multiple individuals, and they all look like this. So we have like this weird derived feature that is derived in a way that isn't something that becomes human or we don't see in any other hominid species uh, going on in the thumb. The spine, we don't have a ton represented from the spine, but what we do have is enough to know that they were small, they were like Lucy sized. Uh, they still had a fairly large um, vertebral, uh, I can't think of words today, sorry, um, openings there. Uh, and so the spine, we don't know much about like what the curvature looked like, how many lumbar vertebrae they had, because we really don't have enough, and we don't know if they all came from the same individual. Um, so we can't say a ton about that, except that at first glance, they do seem to look more Australopithecus-like, at least in terms of body size. The rib cage, OK, I don't know why I did that. Um, OK, so I actually don't have a good picture of our reconstruction of the rib cage, uh, because this hasn't been published yet. And this artist's reconstruction is absolutely terrible and looks nothing like it. But what it ends up looking like is it ends up looking like Lucy. Um, the reconstruction that they were able to do from the ribs that we have, and we have first ribs, and we have um, some terminal ribs at the bottom there. To, that are, make it possible to throw it into a model to see what it, to predict what we think the rib cage would look like. And it's cone-shaped. It looks like something that Lucy would have had. Um, which again, this is all very primitive features that we've got here. And then we get to the pelvis. My baby, so there's like three slides on this. Bear with me. Um, so we have 41 pieces of the Homo naledi pelvis. And this is, sadly, some of the best ones represented here. Uh, so they're not great. They're very fragmentary. Um, it's hard at first glance to get any idea of what we're even looking at. Um, I spent two weeks arguing with people about whether or not I was looking at pieces of scapula or piece of, fragments of scapula or fragments of the pelvis because some of them it was hard to tell. Um, but there's a few pieces here that are useful for morpho morphological comparisons to other species. So uh, I was able to do a few things. Uh, I was able to look at the ilium, so we're looking at the top part of the pelvis here. Uh, and we have this great piece here, 1100. Um, and so here it is in front view, here it is in top view. And this angle uh, kind of represents iliac flare. And it's something that, um, because we don't have the pubis for Homo naledi, we're measuring it at the greater sciatic notch, uh, and then going to the uh, iliac crest, um, right where the uh, iliac pillar actually um, terminates, because all of that is preserved in this piece right here. Uh, and what we can tell from this is that it is very, very flared. This angle looks way more like Lucy than it does a recent human. Uh, and if you, my, my analogy for this is if you picture um, the top of the pelvis as being kind of a bowl. It's kind of bowl-shaped in humans where we have this very steep walls for the ilium. Lucy is different. It's more of a saucer. 
uh, where it's not so steep, it's more plate-like in terms of how the ilium flares out like that. And that's what we're seeing in Homo naledi, is that we would have a top of the pelvis that looks a lot more like Lucy. We also have a whole bunch of ischia preserved. Um, and so there's not a lot to be said about the ischium, but we can look at this feature right here, the tubul tuberoacetabular sulcus, there we go, um, which is the distance between the acetabulum where the leg attaches and the ischial tuberosity where a whole bunch of muscles attach. And this is something that in humans it's very short, and in Lucy it's actually very long, this is a little exaggerated, but um, it's a much longer distance, and it's even longer when you get to chimpanzees. So it's something that seems, based on a couple of data points, to be something that uh, gets shorter over time over hominin evolution. And in Homo naledi, it's pretty short. And again, because I have multiple individuals preserved for this, I know that this isn't some weird aberration uh, or a pathological individual. This is all of Homo naledi seems to have a short uh, TAS. And so this is something where the bottom part of the pelvis does seem to look more like genus Homo, or more human-like. I can go on and on about the pelvis. I won't. We'll end there. Um, but feel free to ask me more questions about it. Moving down the body to the lower limb, uh, the long bones are long. They're, these were not short individuals. Um, I think our high dense estimates are uh, between uh, like four foot nine and five foot three. So, you know, the, these aren't like tiny australopiths running around or anything like that. But they have very, very narrow uh, long bones. So, this is actually just one tibia rotated in four um, directions, although we do have multiple tibia to show. Uh, and they're very narrow, so they weren't supporting a lot of body weight. For the femur, the top of the femur head, um, sorry, not the top of the femur head, the femur neck uh, is uh, basically squished anterior posteriorly, so from front to back, um, and it's elongated. And that elongation, you can kind of see here, actually kind of matches up with what we would expect for the pelvis in terms of getting the gluteal muscles to attach to uh, this femur. It has to stick out a little bit more. But once you get down to the knee, and it's better represented from the tibia than it is femur, although we have a couple of uh, distal femur pieces here, um, this is looking completely like human anatomy, except they're very narrow bones. When we get to the foot, it looks completely human. These are as human as you or I. Um, the only thing is that some, they seem to be uh, small-footed um, in terms of uh, if they were to walk into, you know, Payless shoes or something, they would probably have to shop in uh, the older kids section as opposed to the adult section. Um, but they have the inline big toe, they've got uh, an arch. It's not quite as great as us, but you have to remember these people probably weren't actually wearing shoes, so that's going to affect arch shape some. Um, but otherwise, the foot looks pretty much like ours. And we have this foot that is almost completely preserved. Uh, and then we have multiple foot bones from uh, like a whole bunch of other individuals. It was actually really annoying because I'm good friends with a guy who was uh, with some of the people who were on the foot team. And they were at the table like right next to mine, basically. And I'm sitting there trying to figure out, what am I going to do with these 41 tiny fragments of broken pelvis? And they're like, oh, this is another complete uh, phalanx. This is another one. Oh, we found another one. And they just had like complete bones to deal with. It was really frustrating. <laughs> but it gives us a lot of information about the foot, which is, of course, useful for uh, talking about locomotion and things. And what we come up with is that uh, Homo naledi's locomotion was probably very similar to ours, with the exception of the hip maybe needing to swing around a little more because it seems to be extra flared. So how do we know this is a new species? Well, it's because of the morphology. It's not like we can use the biological species concept here and unless we have a, somebody has a time machine that they want to provide for us to go back in time and see who they were able to um, mate with. So the morphology is really all we have to go on. So what we did was we compared the skeletal morphology of Homo naledi, which represents really the entire skeleton, uh, and we compared it to every other hominin species that had been found, and we looked for differences. And this is a slide I made very quickly this morning. It is not an exhaustive list, um, but we basically, each team was going through every hominin species and testing the null hypothesis of there's no difference between the rising star fossils and this uh, species that we're looking at. And we did this for each part of the body. And in every case, there was at least one, usually multiple, parts of the body that didn't match up with any of the previously known hominin species. And again, not exhaustive at all. 
I'm sure I left many parts of the body out of here, and I wasn't able to fit all of the species that I wanted to on the slide anyway, but um, I wanted it to be readable. So in every case, what we found was that the hypotheses, or, or the null hypotheses, were all rejected. This was different than every other hominin species. So we had to name it a new species. Based on the cranium, the hands, the feet, we decided that it would probably fit better in the genus Homo than it did in the genus Australopithecus. Oh, I forgot about this. Um, so we have a new morpho species using the morphological species concept. Uh, that's what we were able to come up with. And just as a fun aside, the first two weeks, we were so focused in on the stuff at our own table, we weren't really talking to the other groups as much yet. Um, I was convinced that we'd found an Australopithecus because, of course, I had this very loosey flared uh, pelvis, and I was sitting next to the guys who were telling me that it had a very uh, um, cone-shaped rib cage, and I thought, this is definitely something Australopithecus. Boy, was I wrong. So we have this, uh, again, another artist's reconstruction of what Homo naledi might have looked like and how it is different than Homo erectus and uh, Australopithecus afarensis, as the two that the artist chose to picture here. Um, so more based just on the anatomy, we know we're looking at a different species. Now I get to tell you my joke. So why was Homo naledi so grumpy? Because he couldn't get a date. I know, really bad, sorry. Okay, this is the kind of humor that comes to you as you are focusing on fossils for five and a half weeks straight. Um, so uh, one of our colleagues found that uh, the Homo naledi reconstruction by Gertrude looks very similar to the popular uh, internet meme, Grumpy Cat. Um, and the date thing is actually true. We don't have a date for this material. It's not really unusual for South Africa. It's really hard to get uh, dates in South Africa. Um, and some of the problems are that this is found in a cave where it's not found in sediment that we can date very easily. We can date the flowstones, but that really just gives us a very broad uh, cap. And right now, we can only reach the top one. We can't reach the bottom one yet because we haven't finished excavating because there's a lot of bones there. Um, there's no other uh, animal or faunal remains in the cave to give us any idea of faunal species that were alive at the same time that we could use to guess from this. And the bones themselves are preserved in such a way that it makes it very hard to get dates from them, although we are trying. It's just that's destructive, and it required um, sending them out to labs outside of South Africa, which involved a lot of red tape. And so that is in progress right now. Um, and I hope we will soon have a, at least a somewhat range for this that is better than, you know, well, it's younger than, you know, six million years ago, but we don't really know anything past that um, very soon. But the thing with the date is when you think of uh, human evolution, wherever Homo naledi falls, the morphology is weird. If Homo naledi was way back here as something very early, uh, possibly earlier than any other than Australopithecus, before we even get to genus Homo type stuff, it's weird. One, because we wouldn't expect to see something in genus Homo that early, and two, because we have a practically human foot, a practically human hand, um, and a a, uh, cranial, cranial features that are not matching up with the other species of that time period. That would be really strange and kind of mess up how we think about human evolution there. If it falls in the same time span as uh, currently known early Homo assessments, um, it's also going to be weird because, again, it has these really uh, modern looking features like the feet, but then it has these really primitive looking features like the hip that other spe hominin species at that time didn't have. And of course, if it's late, then I'm like, what is going on with this pelvis? Why do we have a pelvis that looks like this if this is something that is you know, living at the time of Neanderthals or something like that? So wherever it falls in the timeline, it's going to be weird. And I can't wait to get into the academic debate of what exactly this means once we do have some data estimates. The other weird thing about Homo naledi is that it was found in this weird chamber that it's hard to get to in this cave system. Well. Okay, let, so we tried really hard to come up with any other explanation for this, uh, for how they got into this cave and what they were doing there. And we were able to reject a lot of hypotheses. The one we couldn't reject was that they purposely put their dead in this cave. We don't know culturally what that means. Like I said, these are small brain creatures that are not human. So we don't 
know what their motivation was for doing this, but we do know there were no other entrances in the past. We can tell that from the geology of the cave. They entered at different times. They're based on how the uh, bodies are deposited in this cave system. These are not deposited in a way where this was all one group that died in there and that was it. This happened multiple times, so it was like a recurring thing. There's no signs of carnivore bites or anything that they were dragged into this cave by another animal. And we are, you know, even if uh, that is absence of evidence isn't evidence of that, there's also the fact that we didn't find any other species in here. There were no other faunal remains in here. And so um, it's a little far-fetched to think that we are looking at a carnivore dragging in just hominins, because that's the only thing they were eating. Um, at least we don't see that anywhere else in the fossil record. There are no other animals present, so it's not like they got washed into this cave or anything like that. Um, there's no evidence of fire or that they were living in the cave. Um, and this is deep in the dark zone, that you have uh, the first like five minutes of the trek into this chamber, you can still get some daylight, there's still some openings and things. Um, but after that, you spend 15 minutes in an area where you can only, the only source of light is what you bring with you. Um, and so why on earth would any creature want to do this? Clearly it's not very popular because we don't find other animal bones in there in the first place. And so this rejects most of the other reasons on why we would usually think we were finding hominins in a cave and leaves us with this admittedly hypothesis that I'm a little skeptical of, that it was uh, intentional deposition. But right now, that's the best hypothesis we have. And we are excited to hear other scientists uh, tell us why that might be wrong, because if we can reject that, then that means that we have to look for something new. And this is how science is gonna progress. So I want you to think about what you think of this. And the reason I want you to think about this is that this data is available. We scanned 89 of the best pieces from the 1500, um, and there's plans to eventually scan more, but it's kind of slow and there's some bureaucracy in that. Um, and just getting the people power in terms of actually getting people to do the scans and get them online uh, takes a while. But there's 89 scans of representing the full body uh, that are up online. There's a website Morphosource. You can, uh, as long as you have an email address and an internet connection, you can download every uh, one of those 89 fossils, the 3D scans of them, look at them with free software on your computer, uh, and analyze them and decide what you think uh, these fossils look like. If you have a 3D printer, you can do 3D printouts. This is uh, a picture of Christina Kilgrove, who's a bioarchaeologist in Florida, um, posted the day we, that the site went live, uh, where she immediately printed out uh, the maxilla and jaw of one of the uh, specimens and uh, posted on Twitter of like, look, these new fossils they just announced, I already have printouts of them in my lab, which is kind of great. So I hope that other scientists are, um, including people in this room, are going to be looking at this data and coming up with their own hypotheses on what's going on. Uh, and I also just want to give a quick shout out, if you happen to be attending the AAPA meetings this year, uh, Saturday morning we are having an entire session on Homo naledi that I hope people attend because we are going to be talking about all of the stuff in far greater detail than I had time to do today. So while this is the end of my talk, uh, this is not the end of the story. We currently have cavers and excavators who are still working in the cave system. We are currently not excavating in the uh, Dinaledi chamber where these fossils came from, but are instead exploring other chambers, partially because we're hoping that we're gonna find some that are associated with fauna. Um, but there's still stuff going on and we're gonna find new things and we're looking into getting dates. Uh, we're looking to see if it's possible to get DNA from these creatures. Um, personally, I'm not very hopeful that we'll be successful in that, but we're looking into it. And so there's going to be more on this story for sure. So. Stay tuned, and thank you. I'm happy to field questions. Some sort of 
um, diet that involves processed foods, whether that's cooked or just you know baked or pulp in some way, we don't know yet. Um, but that's where the isotopes are going to come in, and we're going to hopefully be able to get an answer to that. Do you have any hypothesized causes of death? Uh, we don't. So there's no broken bones. There's one that had a fracture on the toe that healed while they were still alive. So they stubbed their toe and it healed before they died. Um, but it's not like they fell into the cave and died uh, from you know broken limbs or anything like that. Um, there's no sign of like they were butchered or like torn apart. Uh, like I said, we have no animal teeth marks or anything like that. So we don't really have a cause of death, and we have a weird sample for ages that this isn't like it was just like really old people who they got like sent into the cave to die or something like. We have babies, and so um, yeah, we we don't have any hypotheses right now for that. I know there's a whole bunch of different individuals. What what is the most complete single one? Is there a, is there a single articulated skeleton or? So there's a composite skeleton because sadly it's very hard to tell which pieces go together. Um, we can tell some based on age. Some like the hand and part of the wrist were articulated, and so we know those go together. Um, and what they did is when they were excavating these, they had an Arctic scanner with them um, that they were able to scan the surface for so that they know the exact orientation of all of these bones together. And so that's data that we're hoping to go through and try and guess it which ones were individuals that went together. Um, but for most of the fragments, we, we don't really have a good idea of like which part of the pelvis with, with which set of teeth kind of thing. Um, so yeah, we don't really have like a, exact individuals. Most of those 15 individuals are actually only represented by their teeth. Um, for the pelvis, there's like five individuals uh, is the MNI. Uh, but if we have every part of the body represented multiple times in multiple individuals, and so we are able to put together a pretty good composite, which is what the kind of crummy cells in the Nat Geo put together looks like. Yeah. So in the research team thought about this is the dark zone, what kind of light source they would have had back there, or would they, would they have had a different kind of vision that would allow them? Because it seems like that's a pretty treacherous. It is. It does seem very treacherous. There. And it's certainly something, so I have the composite skull that we've made here. Um, they don't have particularly large eye orbits or anything, so we're not thinking like these are nocturnal creatures um, or anything like that. Um, and so it is this question of what kind of light source would they have. Personally, I'm looking with kind of evidence of fire because that puts a lot of my fears aside in terms of what on earth are they doing, how are they doing this. But right now we don't have any evidence of what their light source would have been. So I know you had that um, chart showing us how these specimens compare to other groups. I was just wondering, do you have any data slides that show us how uh, they quantitatively discriminate these specimens from other other? I don't right now. We talked about a little bit in the Eli paper. Not a little bit, it's extensively the Eli paper um, in terms of the comparisons that we made uh, in, in the supplemental material. The original intent is that we were going to, um, at the same time as that paper comes out, have a whole bunch of papers representing each part of the skeleton. So we don't have all of the data and all of the details in that initial paper. And those papers are all in various stages of being reviewed and revised um, and submitted again kind of thing right now. So we are hopeful, like, you know, give us like a year or so and we will have different papers for each part of the skeleton that will include that data um, in a much more open way. Right now there's uh, papers in Nature of Communications on the hand and the foot, um, but so far the rest of them have not actually uh, finished going through the review pub. And just as like a follow-up question, since these are all found like in the same place, is have, what do you guys think about the hypothesis that it's, that the variation you see between this and other groups is just localized population and level of variation? Um, I so I, I've heard that idea before that this is just you know one weird local population that looks different than uh, other members of the possibly the same species um, that we've identified previously. Um, and the problem with it is just that you don't get a Lucy like pelvis with a with a, that dentition. You don't get it with that kind of foot. Um, so they were and so it, it's composite, but we have multiple individuals for each part of the skeleton. So we know that that's what their pelvis look like. We know that that's what their legs look like. Um, and so even though we don't know what exactly one individual looks like, we know overall what they look like at each part of the skeleton. And it just doesn't work out that it matches anything that we see. And so any species, that, any known species previously that you would put it into, um, it ends up expend, extending the range of variation. If you put it in Homo erectus, and suddenly you're saying, Homo erectus had really, really small cranium as well, um, and really strange looking hips. Uh, if you put it in 
um, Australopithecus, then you're saying, well, actually, depending on the species of Australopithecus, some of them had human-looking feet, which, as well as not human-looking feet. And so there's always something that is just like a really jarring mismatch. What were your comparative samples like for like late Australopithecus and early Homo, and in particular, like with the pelvis? What were the comparative specimens that you were using? Uh, for the pelvis, let's see, I looked at, um, well, for early Homo, I looked at KNMER 3228, uh, OH28, um, um and, sorry, somebody's beeping, it's <laughs> throwing me off. Uh, there, uh, Jin Yuan which is later in time and uh, Asian, but, you know, I, I looked at basically anything I could get my hands on in terms of uh, past material to compare it to. Um, I compared it to the manuscript from Gona, although I didn't actually have um, Gona with me. Uh, looked at uh, casts of Lucy. Um, looked at the actual materials from Serpentine and Serpens, which there are a number of them. Uh, and so those were mainly, and so really I did try and look at everything, uh, everything that has been published on um, in terms of uh, pelvic remains. And I was coming at this, having just done my dissertation research looking at Neanderthals, so I also had like, a good idea of what Neanderthals looked like. Um, at least nothing like Neanderthals. Um, so that was what I was doing. Uh, like I said, we did try and bring um, cast material with us from our different institutions to create a large cast collection for different parts of the skeleton. So I know, um, coming from Michigan, I brought a lot of mandibles with us because we have a large sample of those there. Uh, and so um, the team that was working on teeth and also looking at mandible morphology uh, worked with those, and so they had a wide variety. Um, some other people were able to bring materials from and age and things like that. Uh, so casts of material that we weren't able to actually have the originals with us down in South Africa, because of course fossils are travel well. Um, we were we really did try and make sure that we had a good, you know, high quality cast collection to do comparisons from. Um, and the ones that we can compare directly, we tried to make sure that after we scanned the rising star material, we went and saw those fossils in order to try and get a better idea of them. And given the limited sample sizes for any one taxon with a lot of postcranial elements, do you feel that this homoanality is different enough that you can exclude that it's just population level variation or variation within a species? I do, I do. Um, because the, so, I'm kind of a bad paleoanthropologist in the sense that I really get annoyed and bored talking about taxonomy all the time. Um, but when talking, and, and I'm also a huge lover, I love to lump things together and say this is just variation within a species go-to response to almost everything. Um, but when you have species that are mostly defined based on crania, and now suddenly have a species where we can define that based on crania and looking at the postcrania, I don't think we can exclude the postcrania from the discussion in terms of talking about what we're actually um, talking about. And so when the postcrania doesn't match, even if there's cranial features that are similar, that but this is how we got to this is probably genus Homo because yeah, there are some cranial features that are similar to like Homo erectus and I use Homo erectus very broadly, so that comes with a whole of other groups depending on, uh, on your taxonomy um, preferences. But the postcrania doesn't match up at all. And if postcrania doesn't match, then we, that isn't something that's going to vary just between uh, groups within the same species. That's going to be something that is going to be more meaningful when it's the entire postcrania that's separate. So, again, Team Post but that's my view on this, thing. Uh, being as I don't happen to have a set of matching ears, I noticed that the ears of the Maka were very modern looking, and, and I wouldn't see that there could be any, any, any basis at all for such a modern looking ear. You know, I actually have no idea that would be right You're right, those are very modern looking ears. I have no idea what John Gertrude did to base that on. Um, it's much less modern looking nose. I'm not sure that's really just like. The, cat, the, cat, the cat's ears are very modern. <laughs> right, exactly. It's confusing, I know. So, uh, I, I don't know what the thinking was in doing the reconstruction to do that. I apologize. Two questions, though, kind of just out of interest. You said there's infants. Are there children? There are. There are children. Um, there are young adults. There are, uh, I'm going to say teenagers, and that's not quite right. Is this in the MNI of 15 or of the other mm. teens that can't? This this is in the MNI of 15, and so we have only a few of that we know are like full adults. Um, and again, most of those are just based on new teeth. Um, but then we have, there, there's a baby, there's a, a toddler um, that's represented by some of the long bones. The pelvis, we actually have a lot of um, juvenile material, which is difficult because it's not the part of the pelvis that's useful in determining exactly how old it was. Um, 
but we can tell from the size and from uh, the fact that parts of it have a fuse that this is definitely not quite adult yet. Right, so it's in a small M&I, you've got a range mm -hmm. all the way across. Right, yeah, so it's, it's an interesting sample because it allows us to ask different questions than what we've asked from fossil records in where we're only like one or two. Any idea of how many emails you can get? No. There are, so, from the pelvic material, um, the closest we come to looking at features that are, would be considered sexually dimorphic, or possibly predicted to be sexually dimorphic, I'm a little iffy on this, uh, we have four gray sciatic notches. None of them are complete. They all seem pretty wide. I have no idea. One of them's a kid, so that doesn't help me at all. Um, I have no idea if this is like we just happen to find three females and this happens to be wet preserved, or if this is something that was wide at proximal and actually sexually I don't know for the sample. Um, looking at the rest of the skeleton, we have crania that are slightly smaller than others, so if you go off of cranial capacity of size, they, or dental size, you can say like, okay, the slightly smaller ones are female and the slightly larger ones are male, but there's not a lot of diversity between those, and so uh, that variation is pretty small, so it's, I'm kind of on the fence on thinking that that actually represents sex. And the last question is, in terms of getting the bones in the cave, kind of small and can't question, is the only way then to get them to that very last chamber to go all the way through? Could you get up the back and then drop things down to that could. opening? You could drop them down. And the way they're deposited, though, do they look like they could be dropped? Or are they so spread out that someone had to have gone? So, if you with the hypothesis that someone went in. This is a really good question. So, um, the excavated, excavators have assured me that it would be possible for them to have kind of dropped them down the edge of dragon's back and for them to kind of like slouch in there and then as they drop more, those kind of slouch further and push them out. So the deposition could be that. It could be that, yeah. This leads to us knowing that there have, were multiple depositions for this. But that still requires them to get through Superman's fall, climb up through sure. up dragon's back, do all of this in the dark and carry a dead body with them while they're doing this. Pushing up and up Superman. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, so it's... It doesn't totally <laughs> help us that that, if that hypothesis is true, if they weren't actually in the chamber alive. Yeah. <laughs> but then they also somehow dropped them in a way where they didn't break at all, because we have no breaks from that that we would uh, suspect from my assuming they were fresh from us. So do you guys want to have a date on the specimens? I was just wondering, yes. um, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have a sense of how much time there is between the depositions, if you had to guess or estimate? Um, no, the only thing is that uh, we can tell <coughs> they're lined up slightly differently, where we can tell where one deposition ends and the next one begins. And keep in mind, this is all within like eight inches, and so um, I can't go into detail on this because I haven't looked at the data on exactly how they were deposited. I'm just regurgitating what the people excavated it have told me. Um, and so I... I don't think there's a way at this stage to know how they moved around, except that the hand that's fully articulated, um, that wasn't on top, that was actually one of the like second level depositions. And so um, presumably this was long enough, or at least in that case, the prediction is that um, that body was really decomposed before the next layer was uh, deposited on top of it, because that hand stayed together even after that. Um, but that doesn't tell us for like any of the other ones how much time there would have been. And I, without knowing exactly like what the temperature and uh, climate was in the cave, I don't know how long it would have taken it to be close to that level or anything. So, uh, what did you guys have been tried and failed? What is still to be tried? <laughs> um, I don't know. I know that we have a team that's working on that, and I'm not part of that team because it's not my area of expertise. Uh, I'm much more versed in anatomy than postcranial, uh, and so I. I don't know exactly what techniques have been tried. Um, I know that there were talks of uh, using teeth to looking possibly for uranium, something with isotopes. Um, but I don't know the current status of this. I haven't heard anything since September when they were planning on uh, starting this process, and I haven't heard anything that they like found new ones. Um, I know that they've been looking at dating the uh, lodestones, uh, and so they were working on doing the uh, top one in the cave. Um, but I, I don't think they have access to the one that's underneath. We don't know how far down it is. Uh, so even that's kind of on the fence. So this is all stuff that it's in process, and as the science, uh, as the analyses come through, then we'll certainly publish on them as soon as we know. Um, but we're not quite there yet. And with a broad team like this, I'm sadly not an expert on everything. <laughs>